So, uh, so welcome to the 12th uh, uh, Ocam lecture. Uh, the, uh, we started off with the guiding principle uh, that we should not uh, multiply entities without necessity, as, as Ockham said. And so until now, we have only ever had one Ockham speaker. Uh, however, a necessity has arisen uh, <laughs> uh, for, uh, for multiplying the entities as it were. And it may arise towards the end of this lecture that we will have to have an infinity of <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so the necessity is as follows. As the physics students at, at, at Merton have always been uh, privileged in being taught uh, quantum mechanics by uh, James Binney. In fact, this, 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 not this, always. Not well, <laughs> always in the living memory. Well, <laughs> 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 living undergraduate memory. I assume that none of us once were graduated retaining any memory. Uh, so um, and so this has been uh, this has been a sort of a feature of Merton education, a great privilege. Uh, but now we are preparing to uh, welcome Professor Simon Saunders uh, to join the Merton Fellowship, and and as a, uh, as a result of that, uh, also uh, for the first time in many years, to welcome uh, uh, those wishing to read for physics and philosophy uh, to this college. Uh, and so uh, we are preparing for many years of heated debates between these, uh, between philosophers, physicists, and philosophers and physicists <laughs> uh, about what it all means. Uh, and so it's become important to uh, set up these debates uh, uh, to, to put them on a on a firm basis, and uh, you know indeed start with the current crop of physicists and philosophers. So I'd like to particularly welcome uh, the philosophers amongst you uh, who have. En masse joined for the first time the, uh, this, this Occam endeavor, and hopefully this, this tradition will continue with this, uh, with this uh, uh, joining of physics and philosophy at the hip, as it were. Uh, so um, I, the, the, so the, the debate is, is going to be mediated by our two uh, uh, other tutors in philosophy and, in, and uh, physics, in, in philosophy, Ralph Bader, and in physics, Alan Barr, as well. Hand over to Alan uh, to. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Alex. I'm, I'm rather hoping that since we're amongst friends, we can have a debate which is, well, friendly and frank uh, and fun as well. Uh, what, uh, what the way things are going to work during today is that, well, first off, I'm just going to state what I perceive to be the problem or what is generally agreed to be the problem. Uh, and then <coughs> Professor Saunders is going to uh, speak for a little while about his... Uh, his take on this problem. Then Professor Binney will do the same. After this, there will be a, a tete-a-tete -tete between the two, mediated uh, by, by, by this buffer in the middle, <laughs> as best we can. Uh, and after that, there will be an opportunity for you in the audience to ask your own questions uh, to either or both of the speakers, as you prefer. And, uh, and, uh, and, and again, I would echo Alex's word. I, I'd like to thank you uh, again for attending this 12th Ockham Lecture, this first Ockham debate. And, and welcome to Merton, for those of you who are not here, uh, who have not here, been here before. <laughs> All of you are here now, as far as one can tell. So I, I observe you, therefore you are there. So the, the statement of the problem is the following, and I'm going to do this very briefly. The, in quantum mechanics, two different things happen to a system when it evolves. And those two things happen very, very differently. Right. So in quantum mechanics, a system whenever it's not being observed, evolves in a very, very predictable way. So there's, there's a state vector which describes the system, and we know that uh, the system evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, which says that i h bar d by dt of psi is equal to h psi. First order linear differential equation, the state evolves smoothly. It changes over time, but it changes in a predictable way. And this psi tells you the probabilities of outcomes of future measurements. Okay, so this is what happens to the state when it's not evolving, or when it's not uh, being observed. It evolves in this nice, smooth manner. Something very different happens whenever you, whenever you observe it. Whenever you observe it, you get some outcome, uh, A, say, and the probability of that outcome 
is equal to the mod squared of the amplitude associated with that measurement. So you get a particular value, you get a probabilistic value, you say, with probability a half, the spin will be up, or with probability a third, the particle <coughs> will, will be in this range. And what's odd is that at the point where that measurement is made, the system immediately changes. So the system, which was in this state psi, according to the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics, which has been around since the 1920s and was introduced by Bohr and others, the system immediately changes to a system in which uh, only the outcome associated with that particular measurement is non-zero, and all of the others are zero. It collapses. The state collapses. And this is weird, right? The system, whenever it's not being observed, has a smooth evolution. It changes in a predictable way according to a differential equation. Whenever it's observed, it immediately jumps to a different state. Yet, the system has been measured by some physical apparatus. How is it that this system, which is evolving according to the physical laws, can do something which is completely different, even though the laws of physics also ought to apply during the measurement process? This is the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Now, this is the posing of the problem. I don't propose to solve this problem. What I propose to do at this point is to hand over to our two eminent speakers who have given this considerably <coughs> more thought than I. And uh, first of all, I hand over, hand over to Professor Saunders, who has, you know, he has worked on many areas of philosophy of physics, uh, not least on the philosophy of quantum mechanics. And so uh, I'd like you to welcome him now. Okay. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alan. And thank you, James. Uh, it's really a, a privilege. What can I say? Um, and it's, it's especially a privilege, actually, to be giving uh, or participating in an Ockham debate about many worlds, because after all, <laughs> what more extravagant a hypothesis uh, can one imagine uh, than many worlds? Okay. So, um, <coughs> the... Gosh, there was... Oh, yes, it there is. was... Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> this was oh, I want this. <laughs> um, this is rather good. Uh, but a couple of comments. I mean, one is there was talk of um, this partial differential equation that psi was the probability for measurements. And the other was the collapse postulate. Now, in a way, uh, something Wittgenstein once said, you know, by the time the magician has rolled up his sleeves, it's all over. Um, perhaps it's all over already. Uh, <coughs> once you've agreed to this... Uh, really a tension between two kinds of evolution, then there's a problem of measurement. It's just a fact. There's no backing out of it. Uh, this is really something extraordinary and remarkable. What looks to be a fundamental physical law sporadically being interrupted when this process of observation takes place. So I, I want to say a few things about this, whether one can sort of view this as a mistake, um, that one's already buying into things that one shouldn't be, and there are, after all, many, many physicists, I don't know whether James will be among them, who strongly reject the view that there's a collapse of the wave packet. In a sense, deny that there's a problem of measurement as set up in this way. And that's really what I want to spend a few minutes talking about. <coughs> okay, and I want to start off... Well, I suppose, let me just characterise what I think the bottom bottom line for the problem of measurement is this. The quantum state both describes or purports to describe the microscopic realm and perhaps the macroscopic too, and controls probabilities for experimental outcomes. Now, how are those two roles to be reconciled? That's the problem of measurement. And I think I have to work a little bit to get you to agree that the quantum state does describe a microscopic reality. So uh, that's what I'm starting off with. I want to give you the example of a pentacene molecule, <coughs> C22H14, atomic weight 256. Um, it's been much studied. It's well understood. It's a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, five linearly fused benzene rings. The benzene rings, the structure was first uh, described, put down on paper um, uh, almost 140 years ago. A <coughs> um, it's an organic semiconductor. It's one of the acenes. Guess what the others are called? 
yes, tetracine and hexacine, not terribly interesting, but, uh, but this is an extremely interesting molecule. Um, we had the uh, chemists, structural chemists, classical structural chemistry on the left, balls connected with little rods. Here's an atomic force microscopic image uh, released by IBM Labs, I think, in uh, 2009. Um, a couple of years later, they used a variation of a, a scanning uh, tunneling microscope uh, to determine the highest occupied and lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals, the structure, the shapes, and so forth. Um, the, uh, the, the benzene rings themselves um, uh, what is the aromaticity about? It doesn't talk about smell, somehow unrelated, and there's an interesting question how it got to be named that. Uh, but it's um, a structure of six carbon atoms with hydrogen atoms connected. Um, there's two kinds of bonds, um, double bonds, single bonds. Um, the electrons are actually able to uh, really delocalize um, with respect to these two, I should have a pointer, shouldn't I? <coughs> with respect to these two configurations of the benzene ring, and you get essentially a superposition of the two. The double bonds here, the separation is, is smaller than the single bond separation, but once you're in the superposition, actually you've got complete symmetry here. <coughs> um, and the point about this particular way in which essentially un un unoccupied orbitals are interacting with occupied or orbitals and one gets a, a kind of a resonance is it gives unusual stability to the benzene ring and this was appreciated by chemists already in the 1860s and 1870s it was a real problem um, okay so if one looks in more detail at what's going on um, one understands that there's two kinds of bonds there's the pi bonds also called the Armstrong inner circle uh, where you have um, essentially uh, these are electrons in the, um, the p uh, orbitals uh, there's a little bit of overlap here where the carbon atom is located, um, but they're on either side of the, the plane of the, of the benzene disc, um, and they couple with each other, they interact with each other, they actually become somewhat delocalized and go over to something more like, like this, or this is how it can be visually represented. Now, the point I want to make, um, oh, well, I should also say something about um, how it functions, uh, pentacene, coming back to pentacene as a semiconductor. Uh, it, it, it absorbs UV or uh, visual light. Um, the uh, valence band electrons can jump to the conduction band. Uh, they leave behind a hole, something like the Dirac negative energy holes. Um, but these are not negative energies. We're all, this is, these are, is a, a gap in the occupied uh, electron states. Um, these in turn couple with uh, electrons to give you what's called exotic uh, hydrogenic atoms. So this would be positronium, except that the unoccupied hole is screened, so the charge is much reduced. Uh, as a result, the typical scales of these hydrogenics uh, is much larger. The whole thing kind of delocalizes, which is again represented down here. Um, you can have parallel or antiparallel spins that leads to a fine structure to these uh, hydrogenic ac uh, atoms. They're also called Frankel excitons because they can be they can be they can translate through say non-conductive lattices with no transfer of charge. Um, Looking at the scales of these things, this is actually a diagram from uh, 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 ja Jared Morse, I discovered recently, in 1927. So he didn't know much about quantum mechanics, but he got the scale about right. That's an angstrom. This is one of the benzene rings. Uh, so here's the IBM uh, uh, represent the image. You see that the scale is about right. Um, if you plug in the numbers, if you consider the quantum state localized to within a, an angstrom or two, um, for this mass, remember the atomic mass was, what, 200, and 200 odd uh, atomic mass units, um, then it will delocalize with respect to the scale of an angstrom. This is just, you know, look at product of the uncertainty momentum 
and the uncertainty in the position, stick in an angstrom for the uncertainty in the position, consider the uncertainty in the momentum as the mass times the uncertainty in the velocity, how long before you know, the minimum velocity will take you well beyond the one angstrom? Answer, a couple of seconds. So sure, this thing will delocalize within the order of a couple of seconds if left on its own. Um, but of course, in delocalizing, it's not that the whole thing just turns into jelly. If you look at, say, the relative distance, <coughs> have I got a pen? On the right. I mean, if you look at the, if you look at this quantity, uh, so for say two of the electrons or carbon atom electrons, whatever, this thing commutes with the sum of the momenta. And uh, if we're considering the energy, I mean, it, it potential can, can contain some problems here. But basically, the internal structure remains preserved uh, over time. But the center of mass of the thing is what blurs out. But of course, if you embed a uh, pentacene molecule in a crystal, it could be you know, a small grain of dust, maybe a milligram or so. So a milligram of dust, how long will that stay put to within an angstrom? I'm talking about the pentacene model within the grain of dust within an angstrom, it'll stay put for the entire lifetime of the universe. <coughs> and then a factor of 10 or so more. OK, so my point in going through all of this is to say we know an enormous amount about the structure of these molecules. Um, uh, what I've been saying can be repeated in a hundred, a thousand different contexts across condensed matter physics, molecular physics, atomic physics. And the representations that we have are provided by the state, the quantum state, and what you can do with the quantum state. So one's looking, for example, at norms of things like the electron density operator uh, to get a mass distribution uh, or charge distribution um, and so forth. We, we learn from the structure of the quantum state with respect to all of the things I've just been talking about. OK, good. That's the sense in which the quantum state is representative. Now, what goes wrong? I mean, we had some diffusion of the center of mass if you just leave the molecule on its own, but you've got no problem if you embed it in something small like a grain of dust. What really goes wrong? Well, of course, what goes wrong is something like Schrodinger's cat. Right, <coughs> what we have with Schrodinger's cat is we've got a, a, an alpha decay process. Um, if the decay takes place, triggers a Geiger counter, Geiger counter goes off, a hammer strikes a vial of poison. I don't think this sort of thing would have been allowed to go into print these days. But anyway, it went into print in the 30s. Um, poison kills the cat. Or, or it doesn't. The, 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 the decay doesn't take place. Uh, the Geiger counter doesn't respond. Uh, the poison does not go off and so on. Right. So what's the problem with this? If we just have the one process, so here, undecayed quantum state, here's the state of the, of the cat. Of course, you could never write down the state of something as complex and large as a cat. But schematically, we can. And schematically, we've got a very large mass there. Uh, and we can deterministically model this process using, this is this equation, this unitary evolution, uh, to the uh, to the nucleus. Oh, I don't know why I've got that as a nucleus. It should be. Uh, so this is undecayed. This should be undecayed as well. And the cat just stays alive. And this whole thing will be completely representative. It will represent, in a deterministic fashion, the evolution of the system. And there's nothing problematic or paradoxical about it. OK. Equally. If we've got the decayed, the decay products together with the live cat, then given the mechanism that I've described, all of this can be quantum mechanically modeled, all of it unitarily modeled, uh, and we've got the decay and we've got the dead cat. Okay. So there's nothing problematic about that from any standard, any point of view at all. We have a representation of a straightforward, deterministic, physical process, and we can dress it up and make it more and more precise, just the limits of our computational powers and so forth, and the extent to which we're bothered. That's all that enters into this. This is not problematic. There's nothing problematic about it. Here's what's problematic. What if we've got a superposition of the undecayed uh, uranium and the decayed uranium? That's the problem. What happens when we have the superposition? 
And of course, the equation of motion is completely unambiguous as to what will, have, will result from that. What will result from that is this, a superposition of the decayed, undecayed process in the live cat and the decay process in the dead cat. That's what will res result. And of course, the problem is we don't know what that could possibly be, right? That superposition. We don't know what that could possibly be. Unlike the benzene ring, where we can imagine superpositions of different kinds of covalent bonds, uh, <coughs> you know, you sort of fudge the thing out, you squint your eyes a little bit, and it's sort of manageable. But here, what do we make of this? And of course, what we do in the face of this, we introduce the observer. Something has got to break the superposition. Uh, and of course, the thing about this observer is it can't just be any old mechanistic system. I mean, it could. You could turn it into a computer. But the problem is exactly the same process will result in a further superposition of the state of the computer observing the cat dead and a state of the computer observing the cat alive. Or this could be a human being. The cat's no different from a human being in these respects. The thing about the observer and the introduction of the observer and the way that this works in standard quantum mechanics is you do not model it in the theory. An absolute prohibition. You do not model the observer in the theory. OK, so um, I hope to have set up the problem. I hope to have convinced you that what's really required in order to reconcile the situation where you get a unitary evolution yielding a superposition of macroscopically distinct states um, is something like wave packet collapse. Some change, some transformation to the quantum state has to take place. If you accept that the quantum state is, represents anything at all microscopic, and indeed macroscopic, if you believe that, then something has got to break this evolution. If this is a physical law, it's got to be suspended. That is the problem of measurement. Now, as I said, not everybody agrees and wave packet collapse is needed. Um, I did go to, in fact, one of my closest colleagues of many years, uh, a fellow, Manny Welder, uh, tends to deny that any sort of collapse postulate plays any part in modern textbooks in quantum mechanics. So I actually went to uh, Blackwell's and I went through all of the contemporary textbooks um, that I could find there, about 18 or 19 of them. I pulled them all off the shelves and looked. And in the, indi in the index of these books, is, uh, they, 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 none of them had uh, wave packet collapse or projection postulate or anything like that. But then I noticed, well, actually, none of them, very few of them, have the Born rule either. The Born rule is this rule. Uh, so one has to really sort of go through these books a little bit. And I did think that a great, a significant majority of them did. Do, but then I thought, look, look, all that really matters, there's only one book that really matters here. <laughs> So I'm very pleased to find that here we have the collapse of the wave factor. It's very clearly stated. It's on page 15. Uh, this is the third edition, I believe. Uh, I don't advise you to go out and buy it because there'll be a fourth edition, I think, in the, uh, for sale very soon. So I was very happy about this, and then I read on. Uh, but then I discovered this. <laughs> on page 133. Okay. So, so that concerned me, and I thought, well, gosh, um, I perhaps got my work cut out for me. But then I found this later on the same page. OK, so actually, I'm entirely in agreement with all of these statements. Uh, well, I, well, I'm not entirely in agreement, I suppose, with this one. But, but it, the point here, that the, the way in which the collapse hypothesis is false, it's false. I'm sorry to criticize any colleague or anything. But, um, but th this, this is the thing that doesn't usually happen. I mean, it can happen in special circumstances, non-disturbing measurements and so forth. And that's the point here, that whatever happens during the measurement process, it tends not to be nice and clean in the way that many textbooks used to, to have it. OK. Um, but what is, remains the case, and what this statement, I think, is saying, is something happens to the quantum state through a measurement process, which is not not satis it does not describe by the unitary evolution. And that's the crucial thing. As long as you've got that dichotomy, then you've got a problem. Then you have the measurement problem. 
Right, so let me come on to the solution to the measurement problem. It does have a solution. Um, it has actually, I think, three solutions. One is to change the formalism of quantum mechanics. Okay. Uh, and it hinges exactly on this representational versus probabilistic, uh, this dual role of the quantum state. One way to do it is to make the quantum state dynamically be subject to collapse. The, the state remains representational. It describes the microscopic and macroscopic world. Uh, but the evolution is neither of these, neither this thing nor this thing, but something in between. Dynamical collapse theories. Okay, here's another solution. The quantum state is not representational. It doesn't describe the microscopic or macroscopic system. Hidden variables describe the microscopic and macroscopic system. Okay, so that's a second solution. And I'm not very interested in either of those solutions, partly because they don't really fit with relativistic quantum theory, and partly because I think we ought to learn from the physics that we have, rather than trying to make it modify it in order to make it fit a preconceived mold of what we expect. So that is what drove my interest in Many Worlds Everett interpretation, because the Many Worlds Everett interpretation, same thing, no difference in my view, says the unitary evolution continues always under all circumstances and what is happening with the, Sh with the Schrodinger cat example is you do indeed get a superposition of a live and dead cat. Okay, <clears throat> so I'll speak for rather short, very sh just three or four minutes about the many worlds theory because it's a vast subject um, and I think maybe the point of this debate isn't so much whether many worlds make sense, although perhaps that's what it'll turn into, but whether we have a real problem uh, whether the right way to go is to modify the theory, whether th it's a pseudo-problem. Okay, so I hope to have established that it is a real problem, and here's how to solve it just using standard quantum theory. So this goes back to Everett. <coughs> um, the point about the, you know, the, the weird thing that happens when the cat goes into the superposition, and when we, watching the cat, go with it into the superposition, is of course we're unaware of it because each branch that is produced, the superposition of the two terms, has no interaction with one another. And if there's no interaction, there's no awareness, there's no way of communicating, there's no observation possible. And this is a point that Everett made very clearly, actually in a footnote to his paper, um, his supervisor, John Wheeler, uh, didn't really let him say what he really thought. Uh, but he managed to smuggle in his footprint when the, uh, he got the paper in proofs. Um, and he says, look, the, cr the criticism that, you know, th in this branching process, wouldn't we somehow know, like we'd all turn into blancmange or something? It's like the criticism of the Copernican theory that the mobility of the Earth as a real physical fact is incompatible with common sense. We feel, we do not feel the motion of the Earth. You know, Wittgenstein made a very interesting question. He said, what would it look like if it did look like the Earth went round the moon, uh, round the sun? That's an interesting question. And of course, you only have to think about it for a few minutes and you realize, well, it would look just as it does look. But that wasn't obvious in the 17th century. So it was Galileo, of course, who gave all the arguments to show that no, the motion of the Earth around the sun will not be observable. It will not create any strange, weird effects. All right. But look, there's something else going on here, and this is a part of an explanation of why I think it's taken so long for the many worlds theory to be understood, let alone accepted, to, to be understood. See, this is really the highlight of Everett's published paper, and this is what John Wheeler really s signed up to, this so-called relative state point of view. So there does not in general exist anything like a single state for one subsystem of a composite system. Subsystems do not possess states that are independent of the states of the remainder. Okay, you can arbitrarily choose a state for one system and then you have the relative state. Okay, so Wheeler found this tremendously persuasive, so much so that he sent Hugh Everett off to see Niels Bohr in Copenhagen. Niels Bohr didn't like it at all. But anyway, so just so we can get clear on what's going on, so here's the final superposition here. So relative to the, you know, the undecayed process, the cat is alive, or we could stick in here somebody observing the cat being alive. Relative to the live cat, you have a live human observer. Well, the human observer is going to be alive, whatever. Just seeing, hopefully, seeing the cat is alive. Here you'll have a human observer 
seeing the cat is dead, and relative to that human observer, the cat is indeed dead, and so forth. So this was supposed to be the central uh, argument of his paper, and it was certainly the one that was most prominently publicised. <coughs> um, and it's all in italics, notice. That's not me, that's in the original. Okay, but um, I, think, I think that really there's something wrong here. It's not Galileo who is the parallel, it's Descartes. And it's Descartes because if you read this and you think about what is motion, what is motion, which was the question that Descartes asked. And he, you know, he didn't have an Occam debate to cope with, but he had the Inquisition, and it was probably even worse. <laughs> and there were people who were seriously concerned that anyone was claiming that the Earth moved around the Sun. So he was sort of driven to think quite hard about the whole question, what is motion? And he was led to say something very similar to this about motion. And if we go back to what Everett said, you know, Everett does talk about, in the Copernican case, the addition of Newtonian physics was required to show... Yeah, but it wasn't Newtonian physics. I mean, it was just the principle of inertia. That's all that was required to show this. But there was something very important that Newtonian physics was needed to provide to distinguish the real from the apparent motions. What is inertial motion? And it was Newton who gave that analysis. And it was dynamical principles used to pick out real as opposed to apparent motions. And something similar is needed for Everett. Why consider the quantum state resolved into a superposition of states well localized in position momentum? Why that? Why not represent it in terms of superpositions of live and dead cats and the relative states of superpositions of live and dead cats? Why not? What picks out classicality? And the answer is dynamics. Okay, so I have decoherence theory. I have a number of people. I don't know if you can see who they all are. Who's this one? Aaron first. Aaron first. And here? No? That's what Aaron first did. No. He didn't make it. Oh, you mean the, the other world where he didn't commit suicide? Oh, right, that's right. So this is Eugene Wigner. And here? Nobody will get this one. The young David Bohm, at about the time in his 52 paper where he was articulating some of these ideas. This guy, everybody will know this guy, that's Wojciech Zurek. What about him? Gelman. Mario Gelman. And him? Ah, <laughs> oh, poor Jim. Jim Hartle. Jonathan Halliwell. And here, I got this guy kind of in front of all of the others, because he's Dieter Zay, and he was the first one in 1970 to really make the point that this is what was needed to make sense of the Everett interpretation. <coughs> Okay, and here is a bit more, bit more detail on the kind of developments that were relevant to it. I'm not going to try to give you an idea of decoherence theory. I think it, it would take too long, and uh, maybe it's inappropriate. I've been told that I can't assume you know what a density matrix is, so it's hard to do it without a bit of work on density matrices. But I just want to say that decoherence theory does explain why it is that the quantum state has the structure of a superposition of component states each one of which evolves, and this is tremendously important, dynamically evolves independent of the others. Okay, that's the core crucial thing. Dynamic independence in the... And this is why there's a multiplicity at all. Why on earth think that there's a multiplicity in the quantum state? Otherwise, of course, this might think, make you think so, but this is the measurement postulates, which we're doing away with. So why think there's a multiplicity in the quantum state? Answer, it has the structure. It has a dynamically evolving structure of a multiplicity, each of which evolves independent of the others and obeys approximately classical equations. Now, that is not an interpretation-dependent fact. It's a claim about the mathematical structure of the quantum state. In principle, we can feed the quantum state into a computer and we can determine whether or not this is the case or not. And if you think, ah, okay, you can do that Maybe you can do that with some, find some other structure in the quantum state. Well, fine. And if you can do that, you find some other structure in the quantum state, nice dynamical equations, different from the quasi-classical ones, some mul new multiplicity there, publish. You'll get a Nobel Prize for it. Okay? That's the sort of claim that I'm making. I think this is interpretation independent. 
Now, the ways that philosophers for physics have tended to view this, they've tended not to some, you know, philosophers will do anything, but some philosophers criticize this. But the majority have focused on the probability question, how do you interpret probabilities? And they've focused on the fundamental ontology question, what is the ultimate stuff down there at the microscopic level? Now, on the probability question, I just want to say this, Probability is always physical, objective probability out there in the world has always posed huge philosophical puzzle. What is there about the world that makes it the case that the coin that I flip has a chance, one half, of coming up heads? And don't tell me it's because of the symmetry of the coin. It's the way that I flip it. So what is it about the way that I flip it that gives it the probability of one half? It's a dynamical question. What is it about the dynamics that makes the probability one half rather than one third. And that question has really stymied philosophers. Physicists that have thought about it have also found this really, really hard. What Everettian quantum theory says is probabilistic objective, probabilistic events are branching processes and the quantitative probabilities are the modulus squares of the branches. And much more than that, explain all of the phenomenology of probability. Why, for example, it is measured the way that it is. Why is that? Why don't we have good luck charms? Why isn't that, you've all seen Harry Potter, I hope. Why isn't there, what's that potion called? It's the one, the good luck thing you drink is. That's right. <laughs> why, why don't we have some of that wonderful stuff? Now there's something that would be great. This explains why. It explains why probabilities are measured the way they are and can only be measured the way that they are. Okay, I've got to stop, but I do want to end with my favorite wave mechanic. And here's what he says. In order to understand anything in depth, we usually find we need to think of it both as objects and as dynamic processes and see how it all fits together. I tell my students, what is understanding? Understanding means being able to see something from more than one viewpoint, make it all consistent, do it in equations, in words, in pictures, make it all hang together consistently. And very often we say, that's an object, but zoom in and you'll see a process. Decoherence is a process, classical evolving phenomena are processes, and there's a multiplicity of them in the quantum state. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> So I think it's, I mean, my take on this is, is very uh, earthy and unsophisticated. I think quantum mechanics is adult physics where we recognize that any measurement involves a disturbance. We know this in classical physics really, but in classical physics it's possible to imagine that you have a very delicate instrument and also you make corrections for the impact that your instrument has. They're called systematic errors and you correct for them. Anyway, in quantum mechanics, when we talk about the very small things, this is a primary process and we know it. Um, clearly, if measurement involves disturbance, then the evolution of the system depends on when and how we measure. This, of course, is the, the two-slit paradox, that if you watch what passes through one of the slits, you change the interference pattern. That's not mysterious, that's bloody obvious. <laughs> it's an immediate consequence of being grown up and admitting that if you measure something, you disturb it. If it's small, you disturb it a lot. <laughs> I'm disturbed. This one. Ah, oh, right. Okay. I just thought it was grunting in the background. Okay. So the practical way forward is to is to incorporate incorporate some kind of stylized measurements in, into the theory, um, and that's what the Copenhagen. Uh, interpretation did. I don't think the creators, I think it's a beautiful illustration of von Hayek's point about how social, orga social systems are very much more sophisticated than we, than we generally believe and very much more sophisticated than radicals and the political sort <coughs> suppose and that's why you shouldn't mess with them in random ways. You should let them evolve and you should treat them with respect. And the Copenhagen interpretation, I think, is, a, is an example of this. It's something which emerged out of the community and was much more sophisticated, I think, than any particular person in the community appreciated. That's why it's, it's, it's done so well. Anyway, so what it does, the Copenhagen interpretation, is it, it, it the stylized measurements that it works with are 
reproducible measurements because reproducible measurements are good. That is to say, noise-free measurements are reproducible and we don't like noise. So let's focus on reproducible measurements and we'll worry about the noise in our lab at a later iteration when we've decided exactly what the experimental setup is going to be. So obviously the post-measurement uh, state depends on what measurement was made and it's obvious that, um, so <coughs> it's now obvious, Simon, that a measurement of Q causes a jump from the pre-measurement state of psi to the post-measurement state uh, QI which is the result of doing, it's a, it's, a very, and it's a very special state which is defined by the kind of measurement Q that you're making um, because it has this remarkable property that, it's that if you measure Q on the state QI again, you do not change the state. This is a measurement which does not disturb. This is something extraordinary, right? And it isn't something real it's something in your mind. It's, 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 uh, it's something to which you aspire. Okay. Now, obviously, nature doesn't make a jump. What makes a jump is our picture, because we don't want, and why? It's a choice. We decide to do this because we don't want to become involved in the complex and equipment-dependent physics of interaction of the system with our Siemens type SN8A, or was it the Bowens and Loesch Model 42, or whatever. Different people in different laboratories or the same people on the same day on, 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 on the same day are going to make measurements in different ways. And if you have to incorporate the minutiae, as you really do, because how you disturb the system does depend on whether you do it before lunch, you do it after lunch. It does depend on whether you use a Siemens or a Bowson Losch. Of course it does. But you don't want to build all that into your into your theory that you teach in undergraduate courses into the computations that you do when you think about what's, what the cross-section for something or other should be and what Alan is go and his colleagues are going to find when they look at the terabytes of output from, from Atlas, you don't, want to get all, you, you don't want to become involved in that at too early a stage. You do that later. How do we go forwards? Here we go. Okay, probabilistic science. Why isn't a psi going to QI given by the time-dependent Schrodinger equation? This is the measurement problem, as Simon clearly said. Half-truth, because we didn't add to the Hamiltonian of the system the interaction Hamiltonian with the Siemens, or the Bausch and whatever it was, right? And we didn't do that because, for these general reasons, we didn't want to. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't strategic because it would tie us down to a particular kind of measurement. If there's a deeper truth, though, it's because the post-measurement state system doesn't have a quantum state. Quantum mechanics says that it doesn't have a quantum state. Why? Because it has entangled itself with your measuring instrument, and the measuring instrument plus the system have a quantum state. Well, sorry, they don't have a quantum state. They, they are described by a density operator, and the terms of engagement were that we weren't going to explain about density <laughs> operators, so this is a little tricky. Um, <laughs> but the key thing is that, uh, that, that, the key thing is that you, uh, well, sorry, how was I going to handle this? Um, so the point, the, the simple, the, the, the important physical idea is that when you make a measurement, you, 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 you entangle, you, you seek to make your measuring equipment correlated with the system that you're trying to measure. So that when you look at the measuring equipment, you can draw inferences about the system you're trying to measure. That's, that's, that is, that's a no-brainer, that's just self-evident that that's true. Um, and this, this, this correlation is described in quantum mechanics by, uh, uh, by entanglement. And the so, th so the, the key thing is that the measuring instrument, it, we do not know its quantum state before the experiment because it has so many accessible quantum states uh, and it, that we, we would require some by 10 to the 24 measurements in order to determine which quantum state it was in and we're certainly not doing that. So the fact of the matter is we do not know what quantum state the instrument is in before we do the measurement. It is in some quantum state. But we do not know which so we say we assign probabilities to, its, to the various uh, states that it's in. That's what statistical mechanics is about, a particular rational way of doing that. 
we assign probability to classical probabilities that reflect our bloody ignorance. Do not reflect intrinsic uncertainty. They reflect our bloody ignorance of what's actually the state of the system. And when it entangles itself with the system, it transfers that, and this is not, this is not contentious, this is, this, is, you know, this is just mathematical fact, it transfers that probability, that classical uncertainty, that classical ignorance to our system because how our system evolves is going to depend on the state that our system was, that our measuring instrument was in before we put it into contact with our system. That's the principle that, we, that's, the pr that's the mechanism by which we're going to get this correlation between the system and, and our instrument, which is the fundamental, it, it, uh, it, it, it's the whole thing, the whole rationale that underlies our measurement program, which, and the consequence of the uncertainty in the, uh, of the measuring equipment is that at the end of the experiment, our system is un is, has classical uncertainty, and that is why we have the Bohr rule, that that at the end of the experiment, at the end of the interaction, the system is not actually in the state QI. It's actually in one of them, and we don't know which, but we can assign probabilities to those very classical probabilities that arise entirely out of the, the classical uncertainty in the initial configuration of the, ba of the, of the instrument. Um, and uh, so that's how we, that, that's, that's, that's the interpretation of that. Okay, why was the Siemens in an impure state? That's say, why was there classical uncertainty? I guess they've, I've kind of said that. If you want to measure, if you want to, most systems, in fact, are in classically uh, are not in well-defined quantum states. That is to say, we're ignorant of their quantum state. Take a poor old electron. If you want to get that into a well-defined state, you need to measure its position or its momentum. You then need to, to measure the comp one component of its spin. So that's, quite, that's, that's a couple of things to measure. If you want a hydrogen atom, you've got to measure its position and momentum, then you've got to measure something like the, the energy, the angular momentum, and its orientation of the electron, and you've got to measure the spin of the electron. If you want to, to get a measuring instrument with 10 to the 24 atoms, you're going to have to measure several, several by 10 to the 24 measurements. So there's no way that a measuring instrument, or indeed a cat, can ever be in a well-defined quantum state. And there's just no point in discussing linear superpositions of live and dead cats. It just, it just doesn't correspond to reality, so what's the point in discussing it? The, macro, the quantum states, the macroscopic objects, and even viruses are unknowable. Um, it's all, so th th I've really, really said it. It's obvious that when we have uh, two systems that are dynamically coupled, the evolution of, of each system depends on the state of the other system, and therefore the evolution of our, the system we're trying to measure, the atom, whatever <coughs> it is, is going to depend on the dynamical, on the quantum state of our measuring quit, which we do not know, to which we can only assign probabilities. And as time goes on, the extent of dependence of this, the state of our system uh, on the equipment increases, and therefore the uncertainty in the state of our system increases. Um, we, we, we seek this correlation, um, that's that the instrument builder, I mean, that, that's how we, as I say, that's how we, it's through that correlation that we're hoping to learn something by inspecting the instrument. So the system's post-measurement state is definitely unknown. It's unknown to us, but it is well-defined. I'm not saying it's a linear supposition. It is, it is in some particular quantum state, but we do not know which. Um, So, and, and the, instrument, the instrument builder ensures that the classical uncertainty surrounding the post-measurement system can be resolved by a crude inspection. It's very important that we escape from the concept of measurement at this stage by saying that what we now do is we assess, broadly speaking, what kind of, what kind of quantum state is our measuring instrument in? Is it in uh, a type 1 state, which might contain, it might contain 10 to the 20 quantum states, uh, or is it in a type 2 state of another 10 to the 20 quantum states? And the general idea is that if I figure that it's in a type 1 state, then from my knowledge of the coupled dynamics of the instrument with the measurement system, I can infer that, that the quantum state of the, of, the, of the system that I'm measuring is now Q1. If I find it's in a type 2 state, it's in Q2, etc., etc., etc. I think that's how measurement works. Um, Okay, so it is 
I think it is completely beyond, I mean, it, it's completely indisputable that after we have brought our measuring kit, which certainly is in an answer, is, uh, is un whose, whose quantum state is definitely not at all well known to us, into contact with our atom or whatever, our quantum system, I think it is beyond dispute that that, is tr that, that, that has made the quantum state of the system substantially uncertain in a classical sense. It's transferred the, the classical uncertainty in the quantum state of the system, of the, of the instrument, to the system. I think that's beyond dispute. What I'm arguing, without proper basis, is, is that, um, that does this account that all of the probability, what I, what I would like to believe, it seems to me it's on an Occamest principle of economy, I should believe, until it's proved to the contrary, is that all of the probability associated with the post-measurement, so the, the, all of the, the classical probabilities associated with the Born rule, these probabilities uh, arises in this way. Now, is this, uh, it's, um, is this, uh, is this belief, uh, does it fall, is it, a, is it a manifestation of the hidden variable heresy, right? We know that hidden variables, Bell showed that, hi that, the, that hidden variables are not, it's not a sustainable uh, position that the state of us, that the, that the quantum uncertainty associated with a linear superposition of up and down states, that y you cannot argue uh, intelligently that that uncertainty would be resolved if we knew the values of certain counters, certain, certain measurables inside the quantum system. Uh, it, it could be that it claiming that all of the probability derives from some of the, from, from where certainly some of it comes, I don't know, but I personally doubt that that's true. A little bit more about reproducible measurements. Uh, this is very much a caricature of measurement. I argued at the beginning that it was essential that we did work with, given that we, we didn't want to engage with the minutiae of exactly how we were going to make a measurement. So we wanted to talk about we wanted to talk about physics in the round, physics in the general. We had to work with some kind of caricature of measurement once we had agreed that measurement was an integral part of the evolution of, of, of systems, small systems. And what Copenhagen has done is focused on these reproducible uh, measurements. That's to say, uh, it, 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 it's uh, talking about measurements which a, po a position put the state into a, a if, you, if you really measure the position, you leave the, s you, you drive the system, <coughs> you, you, you mechanically drive the system into a, into a state where, it, where the, the result of measuring its position again is certain. If you measure the momentum, you drive it into one of these states where the result of measuring the momentum another time is certain, or the energy, the energy is certain. Now, all these states are deeply unphysical, Right, that in order to be in a state of well-defined momentum, the probability of finding the particle has to be the same at every point in the universe. It's ridiculous. States uh, of well-defined energy have all of their properties completely time independent. It's ridiculous. All of these things are ridiculous. They are ridiculous in the way the Euclidean straight line, endless straight line, is ridiculous. It doesn't stop them being incredibly valuable intellectual tools, but don't take them seriously. They are caricatures. They capture some of what we want to, uh, some of the essence, some of physical reality, but they have aspects, they, 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 they carry you too far, they have aspects which are unreal, um, just because they were, caricatures are, that's what a caricature is, right? Um, and it's obvious, that it's not at all unnatural that they're, that they're unphysical because they have this extraordinary property that if you measure again, you don't, you don't disturb again. But measure, all measurement is disturbance. So it's remarkable, I think, it's astonishing that, that states exist which satisfy this, this property. And if you want to improve quantum mechanics, what you surely want to do is build an interpretation that is that uses a different caricature of measurement than this particular one. Um, okay, so I think a lot of the problem arises, uh, there is a, there's a circularity problem here, and there is a problem with quantum mechanics, uh, and for me this is it. 
that, quant that the Copenhagen interpretation is wonderful, but it is, it's a fantasy world. It's, uh, we are given, a, we are given an, um, a certain structure which has wonderful coherence and so on and so forth, but in order to make contact with the real world, one way or another, it seems to me that people fall back on the collapse hypothesis. And I think this is true even of the decoherence people, but I'm, I don't know enough about it to be sure. So I don't think you can fix Copenhagen with Copenhagen. Um, uh, density operators are an essential ingredient if, if you, uh, are being grown up about the measurement problem because, um, because this classical uncertainty associated with your measuring instrument is absolutely fundamental. Also absolutely fundamental is that measurements, real measurements, uh, never have certain outcomes. They always have error bars, which means that you make an inference that I think it's likely that the value of this thing lies in this interval with a probability distribution that's about like this. Um, so there's all classical probability and measurement are completely inextricably me in uh, entwined. Uh, and you can't move forward if you don't have a formalism which allows for classical uncertainty. Uh, and therefore, to break out, you need, you, need, you need density operators, but you need more. But anyway, here is my, here is my summary. I won't repeat it. Um, I'm done. All right, thank you. <laughs> so, thank you both, uh, both speakers. Uh, what the, now is the time for cross-examination. Right? So, uh, in, in this world, I don't know what's happening in other worlds, but in this world, this is an opportunity for you to ask questions to one another, primarily about what each of you, but what the other one has said in their in their speech. And I, I think I'd like to give Simon, the, since he's just been listening. Mm -hmm. to okay, to thank you. An opportunity mm -hmm. to have been in front of his mind to right. ask James what. Right, right. I mean, f first observation, um, Heisenberg actually came up with a similar point of view. Mm -hmm. It's in his book, Physics and Philosophy. This is Tanner Lectures, uh, I think, in 1957, 58, mm -hmm. something like that. And I think it's long been an attractive point of view that because of um, lack of knowledge about the detailed structure of the experimental device, there's some... Uh, epi we, d we just don't know the details, and that translates into mm -hmm. our lack of knowledge as to the experimental outcome. But I just don't know how this is supposed to work in simple cases. Now, I think the point about complication, um, you know, it's well taken, but there's a tremendous virtue to schematic physics, and most physics is schematic. Mm. Uh, and I think most puzzles in physics are generally answered, or c many are answered at the schematic level. So here's a schematic question. Suppose you've got a spherical wavefront. You've got a single mm -hmm. particle propagating, represented by a spherical wavefront, uh, and it's incident on a screen, and there's some interaction on the screen. And as a result of that, we see whatever, some fluorescence, uh, mm -hmm. some ionization process at some point on the screen rather than another. Now, how exactly is our uncertainty as to the molecular structure of the screen going to explain the random appearance of one point on the screen rather than another? without importing hidden variables to the spherically propagating wave, wave front? Well, particles, of course, don't exist. All that exists is the vacuum. And the vacuum carries, carries fields, and particles are excitations of these fields. And um, what has happened in that case is that um, the electron gun or whatever it was that sent out this wave function shook the Dirac field and the Dirac field shook uh, whatever it was in your, your scintillator or whatever on this screen um, and the one over here, uh, well, um, of course, the, that also is uh, some complicated uh, mass of, um, of fields, but um, I would say as a, as a physicist, this was just resonantly excited. So let's go back to the photoelectric effect. I mean, that's what you roughly speaking described, the photoelectric effect. And there, I think it's pretty clear that the EMAG field shakes the electrons in the metal. Um, and uh, uh, now and then, um, uh, you have nice 
phase coherence and so on and so forth, and you manage to get enough cycles of, uh, with the right phase to shake an electron out of the metal and ping out it comes. Okay, well, um, so can I take the lesson? I mean, are you sure you want to insist on the quantum field? I mean, sure, point taken, but... But it's true. Yes, but it's <laughs> we're, we're back to the issue of, you know, is it appropriate to use elementary physics or not? Um, but all right, if you want to, well, let's work with the quantum field. We've mm. got an excitation in the quantum field, fine. Um, now, how is it that because of a lack of detailed knowledge of the molecular structure of the screen, it's going to be the case that in one few milliseconds, we're going to get a blip in that corner of the screen because presumably the molecules are doing whatever they're doing unbeknownst to us. Yeah. So as to interact the phases are just, uh, I mean, phases are terribly important right. and we, right, we, right, right. we have, yeah, they and, depend and on this. And this is a deterministic interaction. Of course, we don't know how the molecules of the screen are jiggling, but if we did correctly model them jiggling in just that way, deterministically the, electro, the electro electron field would interact with the jiggling molecules mm. so as to give an excitation in that corner of the screen rather than some other corner of the screen. Mm. That's yeah, the claim. But that's the that claim, is I it? I think that's a perfectly reasonable claim. Right. As I say, I don't I think this requires a great deal of work. I'm not I'm not right. saying it's this is self evident. Right, but right, right, right. Um, it's obvious that a lot of randomness is going to be introduced by the fact we don't know the quantum state of that screen. Right. But but I just I think, I think, well, we, we've got the resolution of that, Chris, so I'd like to... Oh, okay, all right. Well, I never quite understood, I mean, it, it seems that with the Many Wells uh, interpretation, we are, we are taking on a huge intellectual overhead, I would say, and, and I never, I never saw I never felt I was getting a good dividend from it. I've never been persuaded that it's making my life make more sense or enabling me to compute something I couldn't previously or doing any other good thing. It won't even buy me a good drink. <laughs> so, so, so can you say something which will, I mean, so on people I respect who, who, who <laughs> have this view, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Tell me that it's uh, <laughs> that it's it's inevitable, right? That it's that it's you you can't avoid it, and you know. Uh, mm. So I've read David Deutsch's book and so on, and um, I, I, I feel I, for me that doesn't work. I feel I do avoid it. So I and and most theories that's true. You know, most things in science you you don't really. You don't, that, but there's a cost. There's a benefit of subscribing, and there's a cost in not subscribing. And for me, the cost-benefit analysis isn't attractive. Can you make it a bit more attractive? Yes. Well, I mean, just a, st a quick comment. You perhaps don't know the right bars to go to. I mean, I've had several <laughs> different things. <laughs> <laughs> we can have a word about that later. But um, another quick comment. If this business of the screen and the jiggling of the molecules, if that really worked, then I think that would be wonderful. And I think you would perhaps solve the fundamental problem, mm -hmm. which is the measurement problem. Uh, and there'd be no need for many worlds. So there's a real issue about does it work okay. or doesn't it work. Um, now, many worlds, I think, is predicated on uh, taking the Schrodinger unitary evolution seriously. I see that. That's it. End of story. Is it the case that we've got a fundamental law or not? Now, if you think we have, then it should apply without restriction. And of course, we can't model accurately complex systems, but schematically, we model them. And but what about modelling the measuring process, right? This, right. Is, this is done with a Hamiltonian, which right. clearly has to go in there. Right. And people don't put it in there, actually. Right, right. right then, right, right, right. In, in those circumstances, they're clearly, I mean, to say that, yeah, if you don't put it in, you can't say that there's a problem right. that the, that the time dependent isn't doing the job because the right time dependent hasn't been brought to bear. Right, right. But we have simplified models of measurement processes where we do model the measurement process and all that happens is you get the superposition of the outcomes. And because your measuring equipment isn't sophisticated enough. Well, well because the model isn't sophisticated enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean the model of the right. model of the right, 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 measuring right, right. equipment, it doesn't but include. But we're back to this question of is the line of thought that you're 
developing, does it really work? Because it's mm. very hard to see how making that model more sophisticated, more accurate, more realistic is going to alleviate the fundamental problem that you'll still be left with the unitary evolution taking you to a superposition of the possible outcomes. Okay. Well, you end up with this density matrix, right? Which, well, wo in, in which m the system doesn't have a state. Sure, and insofar as Everett is alluding to that, I'm 100% behind him. Right? If, if his relativity is merely that I, after the experiment, have to regard the system um, as, a, as a part of the measurement plus system, system, the super system of the two, then this is self-evident truth and we, we don't have a problem. But I, don't, but I do think it should be possible, I mean, maybe this is where there is a real offset, I do think it should be possible to understand the way we make measurements, uh, what I was alluding to there about there are 10 to the 20 states of the measuring kit in which, um, so we can make an assessment of the measuring equipment without measuring it. The problem I think is that as soon as you say that I'm going to then measure the measuring equipment, you're in a hopeless regress. And this is what I meant about the madhouse of the Copenhagen interpretation, that you're trapped inside there with your bras and kets and uh, you, you need another way out. And maybe this is a good yeah, point of time to turn things over to general <laughs> questions and maybe I can start off with one question, namely, to what extent is the debate between the two of you concerned with the nature of probability, where the probability is merely a function of our ignorance and some subjective due to a lack of knowledge, or to what extent does it really represent an objective fact about the world, about the nature and the way which it branches? Is that the underlying source of the disagreement, or is there something merely that manif manifests the deeper disagreement? Well, I think probability is mere ignorance. Right. Well, do you I mean, in philosophy, generally, we normally think there's two kinds of probability. One of them to do with our degrees of belief, bound up with ignorance. But we also think there's some objective chance out there in the world, and quantum mechanics seems to teach us that. So a lot of the debate is about how do those two kinds of probability relate to one another. Uh, the ignorance epistemic so-called probability is very easy to understand. I mean, you can sort of show that if only you obey reasonable, rational constraints on how you order your preferences and so forth, you will act so as to maximize your expected utilities. I, subjective probability just sort of drops out. But it's the objective thing that's so hard to understand. And yes, I think, I think we are actually talking about that, although it hasn't come to the fore. I think the question becomes, I mean, I could rephrase it, if the unitary evolution is a fundamental law, no matter, if we, can't, we can't model electromagnetic classical systems to great accuracy mm. either, but we believe Maxwell's equations are fundamental laws. If the Schrodinger equation is a fundamental law, deterministic, where do objective probabilities come in? And it seems that there is no place for them. Everett, Many Worlds, shows actually that there is through branching structure. Uh, if one rejects Everett, but maintains, yes, there is this unitary evolution which is a fundamental law and is deterministic, then I think one has to reject the view that there are objective probabilities out there in the world. The only chances are just degrees of belief and ignorance. Any questions from the audience? Is, is there still not, maybe this is ignorance of many worlds, but it feels like <coughs> you're moving the class to another point. Because if you've got a system, so if you, if you have a system which is in many different states, and you say, oh, we're actually, there's many branches of what it could be, and we're in one of the branches, surely isn't there still some sort of class into one of those branches? And the same with James's side, is that you're saying that your system is in uh, a specific state, and that is what determines what state you're, what you're measuring then goes into. Isn't that still not actually saying that it, it still is collapsing? In both of those situations, it's still collapsing to one of the actual outcomes, or is that not the case? I agree with you what you're saying about James. But my point of view is that all of the branches are in a superposition, not that they don't collapse, it's just that we're in one of them. It seems to us that all of the other branches have gone away. 
But that's just because we can't interact with them. Will's asking how do we get into one of them, I guess. Yeah. The, 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 evolution, the evolution takes what, what was, takes develop, the superposition develops. All of the elements of the superposition are there. But, but then what, so we know that things are in superposition now when we're looking at them because they're doing things that actually wouldn't exist if they were just in one state. They are, there are, when things are not well defined, they are oscillating between possible states. We're talking about microscopic games. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I, what I don't understand about many worlds is surely it can't explain that because we are then jumping into a, a specific world when we measure it and it then turns into one of them. Well, it, it's rather that the superposition at the microscopic level propagates up to the macroscopic level. Um, we become entangled with the system. And when do we observe it? Yeah, sure. But when we when we couple to it, when we couple to it. No, but the the coupling just means that a super a macroscopic superposition develops, one branch of which is us. So, so there's never there's never a collapse. I think what you're angling for is something steers us into one branch yeah. rather than the other branch. But back off from that picture of some ego or identity, you know, propagating along. Back off from that picture. Take a third person independent perspective. There just is the branch of multiplicity. Each branch has got a bunch of observers as a part of the branch, each of them talking as we are talking, each of them unable to communicate with those in another branch. There never is a moment where there's something propagating through the branching structure. I'm sorry, my eyes glaze over at mention of all these branches. I, it <laughs> <laughs> I believe in the real world. I'm really, I, and I don't see any need to. I, I don't see what I would gain by having this enormous imaginative intellectual leap. Um, why can't I just believe I, I, in the real world and recognize that we're working with a formalism which uh, has been designed to enable us to to give us a simple picture because that's what physics is about it's about taking the complexities of reality and and boiling it down to simple but powerful pictures that enable us to uh, make predictions and I, I just see that our ancestors did that and they left us with something which is it's not perfect but it's a hell of a good thing and it's describing the real world wave functions and stuff are not real well it's a total fantasy world which enables us to compute to to carry uh, our, our our knowledge of initial condition to make some interesting statements about what's going to happen when we do this or that and but again in the real world uh, yeah I, I that, that's to deny that the quantum state is descriptive at all of a microscopic reality or of a microscopic reality no I don't think it's to deny that it's that the quantum it's absolutely descriptive in the sense that it it uh, it in it is a pretty complete picture. As far as we know, it is a complete picture. And when you know what the quantum state is, which you rarely do, that's the problem. But if you know what the quantum state is, you, uh, you know as much about it as you can know. And you can predict as precisely as you can predict. Can, can, we, can we, just before we take that question, I think you, I mean, if you didn't directly answer Will's question as to how you escaped from, from having to collapse in, in your picture. So that's so I think, I think what then I was taking from it is when you said that there are sort of three possibilities, one of those possibilities is that with our framework is not quite right, which you then sort of ignored because that you can't get that very much more today. But surely that's what James is saying, is that actually things like having a well-defined well -defined position, so it can have any energy, or a well-defined momentum, which can have any position in the universe, they are not physically realizable things. Mm. The problem is with how we are. Yeah, how we formulated the problem. And it's, and it's been a choice to formulate it like that, and I can imagine other formulations. No, it's a practical <laughs> one. <laughs> Of having total predictive power, that's what we're away from. 
we have, we have a very good idea about the, the material world, but we don't have total predictive power. That's a very high barrier, I mean, a very high benchmark to set yourself. Sorry, continue. Um, no, I, it, so, um, <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have interrupted. <laughs> Um, the, the, the point is to interpret a theory. Um, we have a theory. Can we take it realistically? If so, how does it describe the world? Yes, we can take it seriously. We can accept that it describes the world. The Schrodinger equation is a universal law. This is the world that it describes. So it, it's not if, if one was inputting some extra hypotheses into the theory, then I think it, it would be vulnerable to this kind of charge. You know, you're making hypotheses that are unverifiable, don't change any of our predictions. Uh, you know, this is not scientific. It's rather crucial that no presumptions, assumptions, hypotheses, nothing is added. We're just taking quantum mechanics as is, trying to learn what it's telling us. I think one payoff you get from it is a, a tolerably clear way to talk about the theory in the way we talk about theory normally in physics. In other words, it's a tolerably clear way of talking about the theory representationally, and which avoids us having to get kind of tangled up in various kind of awkward pieces of terminological infelicities when we teach it, when we say various things about the macro and micro transition. And I, I think that way of using it is actually compatible with being willing to say, well, as a practical down-to-earth physicist, I don't believe all the things it says. I, you know, and, and I think I think if you look at something like Hawking and the way he, the, the way um, he discusses sort of issues of quantum cosmology, he's perfectly happy to use the language of branches of Ever of Everett, even while at the same time professing uh, professing very robust um, views that the only bits of physics that are that we should really take seriously are the bits that tell us about observation. I think it moves that kind of habit of saying, well, we don't, not, not all of our physics is descriptive of the world in various places because of various pragmatism, in, in, into a more manageable place, and it, it lets our, our, our way of talking be a more, bit more controllable. And the second thing it gets you, in funny sense, it lets you stop worrying about the measurement problem. In almost any other comment from anybody, including some of the things I was saying earlier, who thinks seriously about the measurement problem, becomes committed to saying, well, of course there's a great deal of work required to make all of this work out. Um, uh, but, it, but it can be kind of, we might optimistically hope that something like that can be worked out. But, and uh, almost all these other moves commit you in one way or another to some kind of big research pro program which has only begun. There's a funny sense which the Everett interpretation is quite conservative and dismissive about, me dismissive about the measurement problem. It says basically, okay, this sorts it out, nothing to see, move along, we can now get on with doing quantum mechanics rather than puzzling about the, the, the internal bits of quantum mechanics. But I have to engage with the measurement problem because, as I say, all measurement is disturbance. So if you don't address the manner of the disturbance, how can you possibly have a true and satisfactory theory of nature? What we have is something that's provisional. I mean, because we haven't, we haven't even in single, we haven't demonstrated that in single examples you can do something like this. But I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I just, I just don't think that, that this is a... In, in, in general, I don't want to discuss, it is right not to discuss the, the details of the interaction between the instrument and the system. But I think it's entirely unsatisfactory not to be able to do that in concrete examples. Okay, so I guess it's a technical claim which we'll get into that you can do that in a pretty satisfactory fashion in ways that do include to a large extent your um, desire to have a much wider notion of quantum mechanics. Oh. Similarly, you know, you have to do that. Do you 
Right. Um, well, I think we've got to break this down a little bit. I mean, if we're looking at the list of people I actually gave, um, about half of them were pre-Everett and half were post-Everett. Of the post-Everettians, um, Wojciech Zurich has been on off Everett or not for 30 years. <laughs> and you can read bits of his papers where he's Everettian and other bits where he's not and so forth. I think what is true of... Uh, Jonathan Halliwell is extremely neutral, very much sits on the fence when it comes to issues of realism, anti-realism, instrumentalism and so forth. I mean, James is entirely right that one doesn't have to go down this route. Instrumentalism functions extraordinarily well in quantum mechanics. Although I, I do think there tends to be a bit of a disconnect as to some of the ways in which that goes. Um, anyway, um, uh, d d j Jim Hartle is mostly Everettian. He's got a negative probability line that he's been playing with for the last year or two with Murray Gellman. But otherwise, he's broadly Everettian. He likes to back <coughs> off from conflict. I, I think the point is a lot of physicists are reluctant to get involved in semi-quasi-philosophical debates. Um, and if they can r root, you know, ground the thing at the level of, look, I'm doing calculations um, with simple models, density matrices, exploring how the unitary evolution drives processes, decohering processes, what are the appropriate density matrices to use in more and more complex situations. And I think there is a, a real attempt, and it's been ongoing and likely to continue, to, to get better and better, sharper and sharper, more and more precise models of real-life measurement processes. I think quantum computing, above all, brings Quite that it. to life and makes <coughs> it a tremendous technological challenge, both to build the instrumentation and the control systems, but also to model it theoretically. So physicists, I think, are happy to back off from the philosophical questions. I think that's probably quite appropriate. Uh, I don't know if I have much more to say than that. Yeah, I just want, if I, it's possible that I entirely misunderstood the structure of Professor Saunders' talk, but I, it, the way I understood it was that he started with the Pentasy model in order to demonstrate an example of a superposition that's generally accepted um, as being a superposition. It was more to show the quantum state is representational, that it represents, describes microscopic systems. Yes, yeah, so then my question to Professor Binney would be how you sort of incorporate that into the way that you would sort of try to deny the, that this is representational in that way. Sorry, when did I deny that it was <laughs> represent? <laughs> Perhaps I misunderstood, but as in the way that you tried to say that it is in one state, that it, you're not denying that it collapses as such, right? I, I'm saying that when you make a measurement, in pre you engage, you you engage with it, with something which is uh, in an uncertain initial condition and therefore you, you take it to an uncertain, to an, it then becomes probabilistic where it ends up as a result of the measurement. And that you resolve this uncertainty by a subsequent inspection of your equipment, your measuring instrument, and deciding that it's in a type 42 state and from which you then, from your knowledge of the detailed dynamics, infer that the other one is in, is in eigenstate 42 of the observable that that operator measures. Actually, of course, you don't discover that it's exactly in 42 at the end of the thing. You'll, bet you'll, you'll, you'll have some... That state will have a decent probability and the neighbouring states will have small probabilities, you hope, if the engineers have done their job well. But collapse? I don't know. I, 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 uh, is that... That's my interpretation of what happens during collapse, that at all times things have well-defined quantum states, but most of the time we don't know what they are, which is why we have to use density operators. Is it or is it not in some specific quantum state? 
Well, in our branch, our branch is one yeah, of the... Uh, it would help if, if first there were a yes or no. <laughs> 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 yes. Yes, right? Yes. Now, in that case, what is this many worlds business? This is a legend. Well, the, the, because the, it's one, there is a, a unique state describing our universe. Right. There's another unique state describing a very similar universe, but a little bit different. And there's another unique state describing and so forth. And the superposition of them all exists and is real and evolves unitarily. So if I were just speaking about the evolution of the wave function of our universe, you don't think we can explain uh, various appearance of such chaos? Oh, sure we could. We can ignore the, the, the states of all of the parallel universes. Absolutely, we can ignore them because they don't interact with ours. And what the unitary evolution of the state just describing our universe does is evolve into a superposition. So in that sense, our universe branches. Can I object? I mean, can I vigorously object that, that <laughs> a superposition of two states is as, is as good a state as, as either of the two things it's a superposition of, right? Yeah. Right. So th there's no, being a superposition is, I mean, everybody's a superposition and everybody's not a superposition. It's, a, it's, an, it, it's not a property being a superposition, right? So, so it, it, only, it only becomes a property if you have some narrow-minded view about what the basis vectors are, that you're going, the basis states you're going to expand in. And I don't, so I don't understand this discussion at all because I don't understand what gives us the sacred basis vectors that we should regard as... Yeah, yeah. And I, my, my, I had the same problem when you were talking about pentazine or whatever it was, yeah. that I didn't understand why I should regard this series of dashes or that series of dashes as fundamental. They're not, I mean... Yeah, they're just not, and yeah. I have, and I'm, and we should be totally relaxed about superpositions of states being perfectly respectable states. There is a, there is a, an unhealthy tendency in the community to regard them as not, uh, <coughs> as, as, the, but these basis states are mostly highly artificial, and therefore superpositions of basis states are actually a hell of a lot more <laughs> real than the weirdo states we make them out of by yeah, superposition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not particularly interested in basis states as such. I mean, and what I'm more interested in is effective equations. So take the unitary yeah. evolving state. Um, can it be described as effectively uh, a system of parallel, independent, autonomous, dynamical systems? And that's what decoherence theory says. When you branch, you have a universal whatever. So the result is something which is experimental outcome to something like that, right? Um, something that I can count, that I can count experiment. Um, but observables are often undenumberable. How can you transit from one to the other? Well, I don't think you can count experiments. I mean, it's, it, I don't think the experimental process is not really much different from other kinds of processes. It, rather unusually yields, prop uh, propagates from microscopic to macro. It's micro-macro interactions there. That so small changes at the micro level can yield large changes at the macro level. So that's what's special about experiments. But micro-macro interactions are going on all of the time. So there's nothing really special about an experiment it's because what it's got a discrete set of dials and you've got a needle pointing to one of six or seven options. So you're thinking there's only six or seven states of the apparatus. Is that it? Because that's that's not the only differences that exist between measurement outcomes. Yeah, but I'm not talking about the outcome of the experiment, but the fact that when you make an experiment and you have one outcome, regardless of its value, there is one. And if you wanna if you wanna multiply the universe, then you have to have one outcome and another outcome and another outcome and so on and so forth, right? In regardless of your precision. But these universe they are countable. But my present universe before it, it branches can have x which is not countable. It, it can have what? It can x is r, right? Real number. Real number. Which are not countable. Um, yeah, it's Cantor problem, basically. This is what I'm trying to... Right, I'm... So I'm are there going to be many universes? Ah, well, the, 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 the question of how many universes, I think, is just still posed. I mean, it's uh, how many sounds are there, you know? I mean, really, it's, uh, these questions are real posed. You can, you can make them precise by, you know, adopt an explicit coarse graining, and then you can define quantum histories in terms of that coarse graining, and then you can count the number of quantum histories.
but it's, you fixed it up by your coarse graining. It's a bit like saying, you know, how many possible faces are there, human faces? Oh, here's a pixels. I've got a certain number of pixels on my screen. I'm going to take the number of pixels, I'm going to take the factorial, and that's going to give me the number of possible pictures. It's a, an artifact, an artifact of your representation that you're using. So I don't think it's just not well posed. The whole question of how many worlds is not well posed. <coughs> Yeah, Bose-Einstein concepts are an interesting, I mean, clearly are a counter, a, a counter example. I mean, when I say it's him, um, in, they're incredibly special, right? And people recently win Nobel Prizes because you, you uh, and I guess superfluidity is another, another example, where in very special cases, if you deprive the system of energy very vigorously, you can infer um, that it's probably not, entirely in one state, but it's, it, it's very strongly, it has a very large uh, probability associated with, it has a n totally non-trivial probability associated with one state. But this is very rare, doesn't refer to cats, doesn't refer to standard instruments in the laboratory. But in the end, it boils down that this is just a purely intellectual fiction of understanding of the real uh, process. Uh, whereas we have on the other, on the other side, uh, Shannon's formulation of it, which uh, from which he can derive this himself. So, how applying this to the many worlds theory? Uh, is it just purely as a purely intellectual fiction? Is it? Even worth considering then. Do you mean Gibbs rather than Boltzmann? Are you talking about a Gibbs ensemble where you've got an infinite yeah. number of samples of a gas and you're going to interpret probabilities with respect to that ensemble? Is that what you've got in mind? Well, there is Boltzmann's formulation. But that's just a way of calculating the phase space volumes. Huh? That's just a way of calculating the phase space volumes. Yes. But, but, it, but, but the way I think about it, it's all, it's all, it's all related to the <coughs> human world theory, isn't it? Because you create, you create n copies of our universe. Mm -hmm. And through the measurement, we are driven into a certain branch. So we uh, pick the source of the certain branch. I, I, I suppose I'm just not getting the connection, particularly with Boltzmann's views about statistical mechanics. I mean, normally Boltzmann is, is held up, in, amongst philosophers of physics anyway, as an example of someone who is, is realist. You know, the entropy of a system is a property of that very physical system in front of me. It's bound up with the macro state of that system and the volume of phase space that is thereby defined. Logarithm of that volume, that's your entropy. So that's very physical. It's about a concrete system right there in front of you. There's none of the Gibbsian stuff when you've got an ensemble of gases. Okay, so, so that's my confusion with, I, I, I don't quite see the connection with, with Boltzmann. Right? So, um, but on, on the business of is it a fiction in many worlds, no, I mean, the, 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 claim, <coughs> the claim is uh, we, we have restricted access to the universe. I mean, we have restricted access just in the classical view. Where, you know, here we are confined to planet Earth and we, we have very restricted access. We, we have these little vibrations in the electromagnetic spectrum and on the basis of that, incredibly faint, we construct this extraordinary picture of this universe within which we live. And of course, we don't have to take that seriously either if we're just going to say, look, we're just talking about what's measured here. 
all we're doing is measuring electromagnetic radiation. There's no further inference to some vast collection of billions of galaxies and so forth. So, you know, you can, you can be an instrumentalist about modern cosmology as well. Uh, so in the Everettian case, you, we have restricted access. We are in whatever branch we are, one component of the wave function. What is our evidence for the wave function? Well, in our one component of it that we see, whenever we can isolate a microscopic system reasonably well, screen it off, stop it getting entangled with its surrounding, it evolves unitarily. That seems to be law-like. If we say that that law is universal, then it will result in entanglements with macroscopic systems. You'll get superpositions of macroscopic systems which cease to be interacting with one another. You will get branching. So that's the basis for it. It's completely realist. It's very straightforward. It's actually you know, quite clunky. I mean, it, it's not very <laughs> sophisticated. I mean, what maybe is sophisticated is just working out some of the details of how the probability interpretation goes and, of course, setting up more and more specific and refined and precise models of real life decohering processes, above all experimental processes, but also just natural processes that go on all the, all the time. We have a handful, maybe two more questions. The one in the back. Yes. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so the question is which is the better description? Um, and I guess. The argument could be about which description gives a better understanding. Um, but really, isn't understanding just a measure of the the, um, the self consistency of our viewpoint? So we say we understand something if we say if we have a viewpoint that within itself is consistent. Um, whereas ultimately in physics, what we're really really bothered about is uh, predictive power. So on, on that basis, isn't there really no difference? Well, I, let me defend my position in the sense that I think they're just running away from the necessary task of understanding what happens when you make a measurement. It's clear that what happens when you make a measurement is very complicated. It's, it's because you're engaging with this. Uh, I think that all happens according to unitarity and everything. I, there's totally common ground there. And I'm just saying that Copenhagen says, well, let's just, let's just abbreviate that and stick down these probabilities. Uh, I don't think we should run away from that problem because if we want to understand things properly, we should be sure that, uh, that we do know what happens when you make a measurement. So I think they're just running away uh, into a fantasy world from the real world, and I think it's our job to understand the real world, even if on a day-to-day -day basis, we're sure as hell not going to follow this through and it's not going to have any practical... Well, on the other hand, when you want to do quantum computing, etc., 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 you have to engage with this. And I think that's what these decoherence people are actually doing. They are slowly picking their way through this, through this uh, myriad of this, this complicated process. So, you know, in five years, ten years' time, I expect this law be ticketed, docketed, and it'll be so complicated nobody will want to read the papers again and that'll be fine. We'll be able to say, well, that's <laughs> fine. That's done. The blogs did that. But that's very interesting because I completely agree with you. So, But I think you were targeting Copenhagen, but perhaps you're targeting Everettian. The point about Everett, it seems to me, decoherence-based Everett, is it's exactly looking at the detailed mechanisms of, of real life uh, as mm. far as one can. It's the attempt to get much more accurate, much more precise description of what's going on through measurement processes and other kinds of micro-macro mm. processes. So, so, so maybe boringly, at the end of the day, we will all concur. <laughs> oh, no, we need one more question. <laughs> <laughs> Measurement apparatus for which 
which you do not need a microscopic number of measurements to fix its state. Right? Because, because what, what, I mean, it actually looks to me very similar to the, to the sort of the way things emerge in construction of systems next door. Right? You, have, you have a couple of atoms, you have everything is deterministic and great and reversible, and you have a couple more and it's still reversible, and mm -hmm. you have 10 to the 23 of them, and suddenly you have entropy and the rest of it. Right? And we come to grips with it via this business of uncertainty and probability as ignorance and so on. But in quantum mechanics, we have this annoying business of, of hidden variables not being allowed. Right? So, so, you know, we, we could have, in the 1950s, we could have been with, I don't know, Einstein instead of with Solzhenitsyn, mm. right? Uh, the same. So, so but I, I think what James is saying is that you can't pose this question of branching until you've gone to a microscopic system. Mm. Which means that if you want, if, if Simon wanted to overthrow James, you could have to come up with an apparatus uh, for which you don't need a 10 to the 24 measure, something made, you know, entirely of quantum condensates, right? Or, 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 or something like that. And maybe that is, uh, that is the practical problem for, yes. or maybe there, there yes. should be a theory that says you can't. Maybe there is, maybe there should be. And, and then in practice, because of the, I mean, the business about what drives quantum computation, which is the impossibility in practice of computing the evolution of the density operator of a non-trivial system, will mean that it isn't possible actually, I mean, it, it will take 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the uh, ages of the universe uh, in order to push through this program in, in practice. It'll only have to be done in an outline and in principle. I can imagine that there'll be a fundamental block there. No, no. That, I mean, quantum, the idea behind quantum computing is that it's impossible to compute the evolution of this system. So let's get the experiment to do the evolution of this system, and then we can figure out what we would have computed had we had uh, a non-polynomial untold amount of time, right? So we know that it's not in practice possible to compute quantum mechanically. Now, there are, we have colleagues in our building who are working on clever schemes. It's all it's what one group of people thinks is impossible. Another group of people f will, with luck, figure it's almost possible that there are, you know, there are shortcuts. You could focus on the important parts of the density operator and, and, and do it. So we don't, who knows what will be true in 100 years' time. But I can, it isn't going to be possible to do this by brute force. And it could be that there's a precisely a connection between the impossibility of doing it by brute force and having a system that's rich enough that I can draw inferences by saying, oh, it's a, it's a type 42 s state it's in, though I don't know which state, but a type 42 state, therefore, you know, the probability it's probably in E42. I have to say, at that point, so at that point, at that point I'd like to first of all contradict James on his statement that, that this will never get you a decent drink. We are all going to get a decent <laughs> drink out of this, and that is imminent. <laughs> but it won't come from the many worlds. It won't come from many worlds <laughs> quantum mechanics. I refute that. Uh, uh, and secondly, uh, we know our homework is to uh, over over dinner to find a way in which we can find a. Uh, an empirical way of determining between these, uh, these two different uh, <laughs> philosophical viewpoints. But uh, most importantly, I'd like to thank both of our speakers again for the time, effort, and, and uh, ferocity with which they've put their, their arguments, respectively. So thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.